Welcome back to Live Like Jesus. In the last session, we looked at the three stories contained in the gospel. A story about our identity, a story about our destiny, and a story about our relationship with God. In this session, I want to begin to unpack the identity story a layer deeper. I want to begin by talking about what we're saved from. Now, you might think, oh, that's obvious, we're saved from sin. And that's exactly right. But the story is a little more nuanced than that. The Bible talks about sin in two different ways. It refers to sin, singular, and sins, plural. And the two are different. To illustrate, let me share an example. I've got some dandelions in my backyard. They just keep popping up year after year, and I'm kind of caught in this struggle with them. And you can try and take care of dandelions a few different ways. The simplest way would be to just fire up the lawnmower and just cut them all down when they pop up. And you might think that solved the problem. I've dealt with all the flowers, not a big deal. But you and I probably both know that within two days, there's going to be a fresh flower staring at me again when I come down the stairs and I look out my backyard window. Because I can't deal with the dandelions by dealing with the plant above the surface. No, to get rid of the dandelions, I have to deal with the plant below the surface. And only when I'm able to do that can I cut off the endless cycle of dandelion heads popping up as fast as I can get rid of them. In the same way, sin refers to sin living below the surface of our humanity. The Bible talks about a sin nature, our very humanity kind of grafted in with sin living within us. And it's out of that sin living within our humanity that sinful actions, sins, wind up coming to the surface. And it's those sinful actions that we're often focused on. It, that's the anger patterns, the, the bad habits, the, the gossip, the fear, the, the anxiety, or whatever it may be. But all of that flows out of a deeper problem that lives underneath, a sinful nature, sin, living with, within us. The Apostle Paul, when he writes about his experience living with sin within him, he says things like this, I can't do the good things I want to do. I try to, but it's impossible. I find myself doing the evil things that I wish I didn't do. And he says things like this. It's not even me that does these sinful actions. It's sin living within me that's producing this fruit. He's talking as a man who's not in control of his own humanity. No, sin has been grafted within him, and it's bearing its fruit of selfishness and self-centeredness and, and the ability to uh, not love one another well. This is the state of each and every one of us as we're born. Adam and Eve, when they fall way back in the garden, sin is grafted into them. Sin begins to live within them, and it's, in a some sense, kind of photocopied on down, generation by generation, as we're all born in that family line. We're born with sin living within us. Before Jesus enters the story of the Bible, there already is a way to deal with sins, those sinful actions. There's this whole temple system that's set up. People go, and the priest makes a sacrifice, and forgiveness is released. But it's only with the coming of Jesus that sin, living within humanity, can be dealt with. This is the point of John the Baptist's powerful statement, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It transcends forgiveness. It goes beyond forgiveness. Forgiveness is included, but there's more to it. And to see that, let's look at the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 6. Writing about the gospel, he says this, for if we have been united with him, with Jesus, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Notice Paul's language there. In this passage, he's not saying, Jesus has come and has died in our place, that he's died for us. Now, there are other passages that, that talk about that, and that's a legitimate facet of the gospel. But in this passage, he's saying, we have been united with Jesus in death and in resurrection. In other words, he's saying this, this is how you can process 
Jesus hanging on the cross, Jesus being buried in the tomb, and Jesus resurrecting to new life. You can look at those things and you can say, when Jesus hangs on the cross, I hang on the cross. When Jesus was buried in the tomb, I was buried. And when Jesus was resurrected to new life, so was I. Those things happened with us joined together. And he goes on to explain, he says, the reason that this happens is so that the sinful us, the old self, would be crucified and brought to nothing. In other words, Jesus deals with our broken humanity. He doesn't look at it and say, hmm, there's some problems here. Let's get to work and fix things. He says, that's not what I want to do. I actually want to kill the broken you. I want to hang the broken you on a cross and bury him or her in a tomb. And what I'm going to do after that is I'm going to breathe new life. I'm going to birth you again. And the scriptures refer to this as calling being born again. We're born again as a new creation. And that new creation now is no longer in Adam's family line. The family line of broken humanity, generation after generation, that we're all born into. No, now we're brought into Jesus' family line where there's no brokenness. There's no brokenness at all. And we're born again into that family line. And when that happens, our humanity is restored to God's original design. In in 2 Corinthians, Paul writes it this way. He says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is the way that we're to process ourselves, the way that we look at ourselves when it comes to our faith. Each and every one of us, we we realize with time, there's a part of us that comes to know that we're born flawed and broken. Our humanity is not what it's supposed to be. But what we may not realize is that the gospel is meant to provide a new humanity for us. The gospel is meant to to give us that new identity, to restore us to God's original design for humanity. The old has passed away, and now the new has come. We've been made a new creation. And that new creation is born again in the image and likeness of God. I want to share a profound thought, and that's this. None of us sees ourselves clearly. We are not who we think we are. Every single one of us, we walk around with a a self-concept. It's called our identity, our, our own picture of who we are. And that identity is not clear because we don't see truth in its fullness. But there is one who does, and that's God the Father. God the Father looks at us, and he does see clearly. He sees who we really are. And that means that a part of our journey of faith is accepting the identity that he bestows upon us, of realizing, you know what, God, I don't understand how it is that I'm totally new. I don't feel new. I still have days where I struggle. I still have days where I do have sinful actions. But you know what? According to you, the old broken me is dead. I am no longer that person. I have been made new and I've been restored to your definition of humanity. I don't even know how that's true, God, but if you say that it's true, then I wanna accept that. You're God and I'm not. And I ask you to give me the faith to believe that and to live that out. As we accept God's definition of who we are, it changes everything with the way that we live our faith out. We set aside the the labels that we put upon ourselves, loser, sinner, failure, whatever it is. We set these things aside and we step into an understanding that we are not who we think we are. No, we are who God says we are. My identity is not determined by me and it's not determined by you. It's not determined by the people around me. It's not determined by the events in my life. My identity is determined by one thing, God's definition of who I am. And that's not up for grabs anymore because it's been solidified in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. As we step into that identity, as we step into embracing that reality and living that out, everything changes.